Imagine you're in a Cessna 310R taking off from Orange County Airport in LA and you have an engine quit. There's not much open space out there and where the question is, where would you go? Stick with us on Flywire as we look at the crash of November 87297. Hi, I'm Scott Purdue, and today on Flywire, we're going to take a look at the short flight of C-310R, the Cessna 310, November 87297 on the 30th of June, 2017. It happened about 9.30 in the morning, and that, uh, the airplane took off from runway 20 right, and that's the long runway at John Wayne at 5,700 feet. Let's take a look at the airport diagram. See here, 20 right is the wide runway, and it's 5,700 feet which is fine for GA airplanes, but there's lots of budget and airline traffic. Airline is very heavy in, very, in periods there at John Wayne. It's a very busy place, and when you fly there, you get that sense of rush and pressure to get on with it. No delays. For jets, there are pretty onerous noise restrictions that require non-normal flight techniques. I used to fly out of there at 737s, and you know I like it actually because you took off in flaps 25 with full power, and frankly, that's impressive performance for a big airplane. I enjoy that stuff. Anyway, one thing I did worry about was an engine failure. That was, there's not much room to abort a takeoff and stay on the runway uh, for jets. But the 310R in this case did not face that sort of problem. The POH says the Excel stop distance at gross weight is 360, 3,645 3, feet, which happens to be the same distance to accelerate to 92 knots and clear a 50, 50 foot obstacle. Runway length was not an issue in this accident. The velocity min control or VMC speed of the 310R is 80 knots. That is the minimum speed that the airplane has enough control authority to counter adverse roll and yaw tendencies with one engine inoperative and one at full power. This is what is the red radial line. That isn't the only speed you need to know to fly a 310. The Cessna POH says that continued flight at VMC near the ground is uh, improbable. That's what they say. The safe single engine speed uh, is 92 knots indicated. And at that speed, you can maintain altitude or attracting the gear and feathering the prop. The best single engine angle of climb speed is 95 knots. The best single engine rate of climb speed is 106 knots. And that is what is known as the blue radial line. Okay, folks call that the blue line. They're referring to the best single engine rate, of spe rate speed. One more thing the book recommends is that the wing should be banked five degrees toward the operative engine. This is actually a certification standard from the FAA and light twins are designed with that speed and bank in mind. It's where you should be with an engine failure uh, in a light twin. So generally for a light twin, the mantra is mixture prop throttle full forward, flaps up, gear up, identify, verify, feather. And at that point, you maintain at least safe single engine speed, blue line, but prefer, you know, or at least safe single engine speed, but preferably blue line. And now you have a little time to go through the checklist and clean up the failed engine. The mantra differs in some airplanes and you must know your particular airplane. Uh, when flying a light twin, I go through the mantra each time I take the runway to prepare myself to be ready for the engine failure that's gonna happen in the next few seconds. Because it may not, but it may, and you need to be re mentally prepared for it. So let's break down the verify part. It's significant that the engine instruments will not give you a definitive indication when the engine has failed. As long as the propeller is spinning, you're going to get some indication on the RPM gauge and the manifold pressure gauges. It's hard to interpret in a glance. It still looks like it's running. But it should be a natural pilot and reaction to deflect the rudder in an attempt to keep the airplane going straight. So the most reliable indication is what is known as your dead foot. Okay. The, uh, here's a picture of the thrust vectors uh, with an engine failure. Wing-mounted engines have a significant moment arm that tries to turn the airplane into the dead engine. And this is a right engine failure in this case. The pilot naturally tries to correct that tendency, and that is his dead foot. Okay. The dead foot should be close to your seat, not exerting any pressure on the rudder, okay? So it's just sit, sitting there. The other one is going to be full. That's going to, the dead foot is the side where the engine has failed. So now that you've identified the failed engine, you verify it by pulling the throttle closed. 
And if there's no change in the airplane's attitude or speed, well, then you've verified that you've identified the correct engine. Then you pull the mixture to idle cut off and the feather and then feather the propeller. Okay. Uh, it takes way longer for me to dis explain what to do here than it actually takes to do in the airplane, but it is essential. You simply must feather the correct engine. People have crashed feathering the wrong one. Uh, at slow speed, a light twin has marginal control and you must get that drag reduced as soon as possible, even if you're below gross weight. And in this particular airplane, it was about a thousand pounds below gross. In the Cessna POH, after you feather the prop, you establish a bank angle of five degrees into the operating engine and milk up the flaps. You clear a 50 foot obstacle at 92 knots, then you accelerate to 106, remember the best single engine rate of climb speed, blue line, and adjust the trim tabs, then secure the failed engine. An important point in the POH is the warning that the propeller on the inoperative engine must be feathered, the landing gear retracted, and wing flex wing flaps up or continued flight may be impossible. Okay, that's a pretty important thing to put in a POH. Practicing this maneuver is probably the most critical thing to be familiar with and, and current in when you fly light twins. The initial yaw angles are very large and control is difficult, very marginal. The reaction must be instinctive. This is the situation that the accident pilot experienced. This pilot's statement to the this is the pilot's statement to the investigators. Let's uh, look at it. The pilot reported that he checked both fuel selectors in main before starting engines, and then again during the run-up, and they remained that way throughout the flight. Shortly after departure from SNA, John Lane, about 400 feet in the air, with flaps at 15 degrees, the right engine lost power. He transmitted Mayday to the tower controller, who immediately cleared him to land. And then he feathered the right propeller and was able to maintain four to 500 feet as he turned right to the downwind in the traffic pattern. Okay, that's what he remembers. Let's listen uh, to the AC ATC tape of that accident sequence right now. Turn to party shortly. I think I'll be doing it on the train. I've got one on the downwind. I think I'll put the Roger. Thank you. Departure. Over departure, so long. So there's a mic. Delta 3, Delta Flight Runway heading, I'll call your left turn out. over the control tower will be off your left side at all times. A helicopter, they're going to be landing Alpha Beam ACI. We're going to choose Delta Kilo for takeoff, Crash Week, Triple Citra, Roger, Delta. General, we're going to choose your right. 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 Traffic is holding on position. We'll continue to your right, Spirit Jet 209. Since that's at 207, runner two's right, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, 297. Go ahead, Southwest 4075, I'd like to push out with one and we got to go back. Southwest 4075, John, thanks for that. Push cruise. Roger that. Oh, hey, we got a Mayday, we got a Mayday. Mayday, say again. 297, Mayday, Mayday. 207, K, say request. Twin Sosa, 207, say request. I make it back to the airport. Kevin. 207, Roger. Right traffic, choose your right, you clear the land. Twin Sosa, again, runway, choose your right, you will clear the land. Clear the land, 297. Centered. Clear 209, cancel your approach clearance and uh, maintain 3,000 flight runway heading or uh, flight your present heading. All right, present heading 3,000, Spirit Jet 209. Wind 240 at 4. Wind 207, your pure gear is up also. I'm sorry? Your uh, gear appears to be up for 207. Yeah, I know. We're, we're still trying to get a little out of this. I'll put it down when I get the final. Roger. I got, I love my right engine. John, I that uh, guy coming back. Yeah, he's... Thunder, uh, Spirit Jet 209, flighting 300. 300, Spirit Jet 209. Well, that pretty much matches the final report, the radar data, 
showed the airplane maintained a speed between 95 and 102 knots, ground speed of course, uh, but it slowed to 93 knots before it turned right towards the runway. And during the turn, the ground speed decayed further to 81 knots. Not a whole lot of difference between indicated probably and ground speed at this point. They're not much in the way of winds. Eyewitness and vi eyewitnesses and video show the airplane in a 45 degree bank, slightly nose high, descending towards the freeway. Then it leveled the wings just before impacting the median. Two witnesses say that the airplane banked at left just pr before impact and the left wing did hit the ground first and the medium, median shearing off that uh, left uh, fuel tank, left tip tank. The, main, the airplane then caught fire and bystanders on the freeway his, heroically, I'll say it heroically because it was burning, they pulled both of the survivors from the wreckage. And both of those people on board survived with back injuries and frankly they were very lucky. It seems like a straightforward engine failure accident with a stall in the final turn. Pilot failed to maintain airspeed sort of thing. Well, I went through the docket of the investigation and I want to talk about what I found. But before I do, I want to talk about something that I think is critically important here. And the FAA hit him on as well in the final report. When I started flying twins, I was taught that the most important thing to do after securing the failed engine was to make all turns away from the failed engine. At the time, folks returned, referred to that as turning away from the dead. You establish that five degree bank into the operating engine, you raise the dead, and that makes it easier to control the airplane. When you turn, you increase bank, and this, in this case to the left, and then return. For very small turns, you can then level the wings, and then the airplane will yaw into the, the dead engine, and then you can roll back, roll back into, the, into the operating engine, but you don't let it go too far. The issue here is, is that turning into the dead engine at slow speed means you have very little to no ability to roll out of the turn. Once you start it, you may not stop it. It would have been a better idea, frankly, in this case, to turn left instead of right in the accident, and turning to the right with the gear down used up all the available energy and the airplane stalled. That was in the turn to the final turn. Granted, the pilot avoided a spin and was able to put the airplane down on the freeway. So good on him for that. Back to the final report, at the scene, the NTSB investigators inventoried the airplane in the location of all the controls and switches. They did a good job doing that. Uh, that's the kind of thing we need all the time, really. Regarding the controls, they found that all power levers were full forward, the flaps were set at 15 degrees down, and the right engine fuel control was on the aux tank. Okay. It is important to note that the tip tanks of a Cessna 310 are the main tanks and the aux tanks are the wing tanks. In this accident, both tip tanks were sheared off on, at the median on impact and most of the fire was associated with the fuel spewing out of those tanks. The engines and magnetos were torn down and uh, then examined to, and when they were found to have no pre-impact damage that would have prevented normal operation. The props were also examined and found to have been turning at impact. I want a foot stomp on this. The impact mark showed that both props were at a low pitch setting at impact. They were rotating and there were no indications that the right prop was feathered on impact. The airplane was equipped with a JPI engine monitor and the data was downloaded and examined and it showed that the right engine quit about 40 seconds after application of the takeoff power. Okay, it did quit. So what happened? Why did it, why did it quit? Well, obviously the pilot thought he had run through the proper drills both for the takeoff and in handling the engine failure when it, when it occurred. I'll give the pilot kudos in deflecting the tower controller's radio call telling him that his gear was not down. Frankly, if he'd put his gear down at that point, then uh, in response to the radio call, the airplane would most likely have stalled and spun and uh, crashed with loss of everyone on board. He just realized in the right turn to final when he put the gear down that he could not make it to the runway and that's why he changed to go to the freeway, freeway there, the 405. I can relate to what the pilot was experiencing at this moment. I had an engine failure in a DC-3 and I'll be the first to admit that I was scared. I mean, it may not turn out right. My right knee was shaking. For a brief second, I flashed on what could happen. 
And then I flushed that and uh, started concentrating on doing what I had to do to keep the airplane flying and to do what I needed to do. The engine had failed on a simulated single engine go around, so in a lot of ways it was just like an engine failure on takeoff with some altitude, very much like what happened to this airplane. I also turned right, but the important difference here was the left engine in my case was the failed engine. I could feel that I had marginal control of the airplane and I concentrated on maintaining my airspeed and attitude, altitude and attitude. And spoiler alert, that, that event ended well. Uh, for 297 it did not. The pilot elected to turn right, which means that he had to fly with extreme precision, not a recommended thing to do, fly into the dead engine. Remember the Cessna's POH says that being able to stay in the air in this situation was improbable. Okay, looking at the mantra, I think it is important uh, and apparent that the pilot did not accomplish any of it. He just flew the airplane exactly as it was when the engine failed. The right engine was not feathered and not secured. All the levers were pushed full forward. The flaps were still in takeoff position at 15 degrees down. To put it simply, he did not execute any of the required steps to stay in control of the airplane, period. Uh, I know you'll probably ask why the engine failed, and like I said before, it did fail. Remember the teardown inspection that they determined that it was in perfect operating condition prior to the impact? What was the cause? Yeah, that's the big question here. The main tank is specified as the tank to be used for takeoff. The fuel boost pump was supposed to be on for takeoff. The investigators found that the left engine was set to the main tank, and the boost pump for that engine was on. The right engine was set on the aux tank with the fuel boost pump on low, which is what you use to switch tanks. It runs, but it switches tanks. So it doesn't run a lot, it doesn't put out a lot. Simply, the right engine failed due to fuel starvation. The JPI engine data showed that the engine failed approximately 40 seconds after application of takeoff power, which frankly is pretty consistent with the amount of time it takes for an engine at high power to use all the fuel in the line from basically the fuel switch to, uh, to the engine. And that matches closely to the pilot's Mayday declaration. The engine ran just long enough to get airborne. If you're like me, uh, you're probably wondering why the pilot would think he had done all the right things. Why wouldn't he aware that when the investigation plainly showed that he did not? Why would he not be aware of that? Frankly, he may not even remember himself what exactly happened. And there's another cl clue in the documents produced during the investigation that sheds some light on the situation. And I think this might be pretty important. Uh, the right engine was installed on the 17th of August in 2010. The accident happened on the 30th of June, 2017. That's almost seven years. And in between those two times, the airplane ran just 6.3 hours, just six hours. Presumably the pilot slash owner was the person that logged those hours and was quite likely that might have been the extent of his currency and proficiency. He remembered the things he was supposed to do in his head, but he did not actually do them. That's a little psychological trick our minds play when we're not proficient. Okay, We don't have the habit patterns, the muscle memory to make to execute that. We just have a memory that we used to be good. That's checklists are good, maybe even critical backstops to a pilot with degraded proficiency. If you watch my videos very much, you know that I'm a proponent of frequent training. It helps keep us sharp, and that may be just the thing that keeps us alive. So my nickel on the grass would be to suggest that you think about developing a set of proficiency exercises that you can practice when you fly to stay current, and do that with regularity. Currency ride every month, maybe more. So thanks for watching. I'll now see you next time on Flywire.